As a small business owner, your to-do list is long. The Knot makes advertising easy and connects you with the right couples at the right time. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast for 15% off your first month with code podcast15. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 308, War Comes to the Philippines. Last time, as Pearl Harbor was being hit by the first surprise attack wave, CNC U.S. Pacific Fleet Admiral Husband Kimmel sent to CNC Asiatic Fleet Admiral Thomas Hart in Manila a warning at local time 2.30 a.m. December 8th. What should have happened next, the activation of MacArthur's aggressive defensive plan on land, in the air, and on the sea, did not happen. The why of this lack of action has been lost to history, yet historians mostly put the blame at MacArthur's feet, as is proper, being the overall commander. Either way, General Lewis Brereton, commander of the Far East Air Force, knew what he wanted to do, At 5 a.m., the sun had yet to make an appearance, but the air commander wanted to be ready at daybreak to send his B-17s to hit Formosa, for surely that's where the enemy would come from. The problem was, and this is where history has to suffer more from presumptions than facts, the air commander was gainsaid by MacArthur's chief of staff, the extremely loyal Brigadier General Richard K. Sutherland. All that Sutherland would say was that the general, that's how everyone, even his wife, Jean Faircloth, referred to MacArthur, was too busy to see him, which makes less sense the more one thinks about it. Either way, Sutherland told Brereton to ready his planes, but to do nothing more until he, Sutherland, got the approval from the general. Then the chief of staff seemed to try to lessen the tension in the room by saying, besides, if you are to attack, we need updated reconnaissance information, which was true enough, but this was still giving away the initiative. Brereton came back to MacArthur's headquarters at 7.15 a.m. to see if permission was given for the attack. The response was, again, no, because the reconnaissance flight sent out ran into clouds over Formosa. Besides, the word from on high was, per Sutherland, that MacArthur wanted to wait for the Japanese to act first in the Philippines. Unsurprisingly, Brereton's angry reply was something along the lines of, what in the hell do you call the events at Pearl Harbor? But it was actually worse than Brereton knew. For Air Force logs show that MacArthur and his chief of staff had been told that enemy fighters and bombers from the carrier Rujo, had attacked the, fortunately, unoccupied airfield in Davao, in southeastern Mindanao, and destroyed two PBYs. The enemy's intentions for the Philippines was clear. Another reconnaissance flight was attempted at 8 a.m., but returned due to mechanical problems. The only thing that stopped Brereton from shouting to the skies that they were all sitting ducks like their counterparts in Pearl, was that the same cloudy weather that had stopped them from gathering reconnaissance was probably stopping the Japanese from taking off. And Brereton was guessing that, clearly, as the enemy had a number of carriers near Pearl, any attack here had to come from Formosa, some 500 miles or 804 kilometers to the north. Brereton was also guessing that the enemy's first objective would be to take out his air power. But what he could not know for certain was if and how the enemy would also go after the airstrip at Davo, located in southern Mindanao, supposedly safe from any attack from Formosa. In truth, the Japanese had already put into motion, as we have seen, the light carrier Rujo to hit the southern airfield, as it would pose a threat to the main attack coming from the north. Either way, Brereton was waiting on MacArthur to give some kind of go-ahead, and the air commander was not the most patient person. 
Then word came, around 9 a.m., that Japanese bombers were flying south from Formosa, which meant they had probably taken off two hours ago. Clearly the skies there had cleared, which made Brereton wish even more that he could go back in time and launch his 7 a.m. raid. Sure enough, at 9.30 a.m., 25 Japanese Army Kawasaki Ki-48 Lily bombers hit Tuge Gararo in northern Luzon, while 17 Army Mitsubishi Ki-21 heavy bombers, capable of carrying 2,000 pounds or 1,000 kilograms of bombs, ravaged Baguio in northwestern Luzon, the city that served as the summer capital. It was the second attack that caused fear to spread throughout Manila, as President Quezon was currently at Baguio, but soon reports came in that he was unharmed. Either way, clearly the Philippines were under attack. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity, and how far would you go to stop someone who is getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins versus Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. As Brereton had prepared his crews to be ready to take off earlier that morning, the remaining B-17s at Clark Field, the main airstrip of MacArthur's, were ordered to lift off ASAP. It didn't matter that many of them did not have full fuel tanks, or none of them had bombs attached. The 15 B-17s took off, if only to avoid a repeat of Pearl Harbor. Fortunately, the various bases' fighters took off as well, to protect the bombers and their various landing sites. Just after these bombing attacks, with everyone asking what was coming next, Brereton was hoping now he would be given the order to hit the enemy air bases on Formosa. So the air commander contacted Sutherland again at 10 a.m., and 14 minutes later, MacArthur himself called back. Unfortunately, the response was, any bombing mission would have to wait, at least until the afternoon, when they would have up-to-date reconnaissance information. Besides, some of the B-17s had been sent out to scout the skies north of Luzon for any enemy transport ships below, but none had been spotted. Whatever the attack was this morning, it was clearly the end of that day's work for the Japanese. Around the time that Brereton was talking to MacArthur, the all-clear signal was given. This meant that the fighters and bombers would start to land around 11 a.m. for refueling and to take on ordnance. Twenty minutes later, Brereton was finally given permission for his raid on Formosa. Around 12.30, the priceless P-40 fighters began to land at Clark Field. This was matched by the planes that had come from Eba and Nichols Field. The plan was, as they refueled, the fighter squadrons at Nichols and Del Carmen Field would be ready to scramble and shield Clark if necessary. However, the 17th Pursuit Squadron of P-40s would land at Clark to avoid wasting time heading further south to Nichols Field on the other side of Manila Bay. As they did not have a designated place, they simply lined up 
wingtip to wingtip in front of the hangars. The 20th Pursuit Squadron, formerly based at Clark, parked in their normal place, along the field's perimeter. As things stood, three B-17s were assigned to conduct a reconnaissance flight over Formosa. Problem was, they did not have the right kind of camera at Clark Field. So, as the pilots were given their orders, the cameras were being flown in from Nielsen Field to the south. And once they had the updated information on appropriate targets, Clark Field's remaining 13 B-17s would take to the skies. It was all just a matter of waiting. But that's when the initiative was taken from the Americans, and they would not ever get it back. Around 11.20 a.m., Eba Field, west by northwest of Clark Field, itself above Manila Bay, reported detecting a large formation of planes coming in from the sea. However, the mountains made keeping contact impossible. Last known information had the supposed enemy planes making for Clark Field. Right away, fighters, P-40s, but also the older P-35s, took off from Del Carmen, just below Clark Field, and from Nichols Field, below Manila Bay, and from Eba itself. However, the 20th and 17th Pursuit Squadrons at Clark did not, though they had been refueled. Added to this lack of a full-throated response was conflicting orders in this moment of crisis to the P-40s about whether they should be protecting the capital versus Clark Field the supposed target. Finally, the 17th Pursuit Squadron was ordered to take off, but they would be sent to the south to shield the capital city. The 20th Pursuit Squadron was ordered to sit in their planes, literally in the hot sun, and await further orders. As for what was coming at the American and Filipino pilots and ground crews was nothing less than 108 Navy Mitsubishi G3M2 Nell and G4M1 Betty bombers, protected by 84 Mitsubishi Zero fighters. And these had a longer range than the Army planes that had struck earlier that morning in northern Luzon. Besides the jumbled and conflicting orders for the various American pilots upon first radar contact, the Far East Air Force HQ just east of Manila City, was trying to help when they sent their own warnings to Clark Field. But the end result was that it only added to the chaos. Either way, their messages did not reach the appropriate officials at Clark, so no coordinated response was taken. And bringing together all the landings and takeoffs of the American and Filipino pilots from that confusing morning, the following took place. At 12.35, Japanese naval fighters strafed Iba Field first, taking out a flight of P-40s while they were landing. Other P-40s were about to land at Iba, but they were ordered now to make for Clark Field. The problem was, now that the radar was taken out at Iba, the Americans were fighting blind. The Japanese fighters and bombers flew on to Clark. And it was here that this perfect storm of events climaxed. The Japanese aircraft reached Clark Field at 12.40, as almost all of the base's planes were on the ground. This left a few P-40s currently on patrol to take on the attackers, and some of their comrades did try to take off to help. But the experienced Japanese pilots carried out their attack runs mostly uninterrupted, just as they had practiced. With American defenses going up in flame, the enemy flew over Clark Field again and again, shooting up or further damaging anything that seemed capable of flight. The Japanese pilots appreciated that the Americans had lined up their targets all nice and neat. It made their work easier. While MacArthur's main airfield was being reduced to rubble, other Japanese planes made for Del Carmen Field, just below Clark. There, the Allied pilots managed to take off and engage the enemy. Unfortunately, they were flying the older Seversky P-35A fighters, which lacked armor and self-sealing tanks. 
Within minutes, twelve Cerveskis were removed from the sky. By the time the day was over, only 17 B-17s were still operational. This was matched by the destruction of 53 P-40 and P-35A fighters. Also, more than two dozen other aircraft were destroyed while on the ground. Observation and training planes, along with many of the transport aircraft. As for the attackers, only seven zeros had been lost, but that was a small price to pay to rule the skies over the Philippines. Now, Japanese planes could, with impunity, attack the ground defense forces, readying things for the invasion forces. That evening and throughout the night, another war came. That would determine whose fault this disastrous day was. The truth, as in most catastrophes, was it was a team loss. Only one of the three radars had been set up. The Japanese had been able to fly reconnaissance routes, picking out their targets until just days before the attack. General Marshall's numerous warnings should have caused the B-17s, which the Japanese respected, to be moved further south, so such a first strike would not be possible. So, as Brereton, MacArthur, and Sutherland pointed fingers at each other with the appropriate accusations of incompetence, while FDR and Marshall screamed for answers, their collective sound and fury signified nothing. The damage was done. The American and Filipino defenders would be fighting blind and outnumbered. With a severely weakened air arm, screaming, no matter how loudly, wouldn't change that. Fortunately, the gods suffer fools as the clouds returned over Formosa to block another Japanese air attack. For next on the attacker's list was the naval installations in Subic Bay to the northwest of the Bataan Peninsula and the shipyard at Cavite in Manila Bay. Though the Japanese had initially assumed that the American air defenses would be vigorous, given that Pearl Harbor had happened seven hours earlier, before they appeared over Philippine skies, General Homa had still sent out invasion forces on December 7th, hoping all would work out and that they would control the skies by December 10th. Yet, on the same day as the first air attack, December 8th, naval infantry units were sent to take Bataan Island, not of Bataan Peninsula infamy, but rather an island located 120 miles or 190 kilometers north of Luzon. The invasion forces proper were also en route to selected points of northern Luzon. There, on Patan Island, Vice Admiral Sueto Hiroshi sent his 490-man force ashore, and they quickly secured the Basco airfield. Right away, the victors began improving the airstrip, and indeed, before December 8th was over, Japanese planes from Formosa landed at Basco. Yet, equally amazed that Clark Field was so easily destroyed, construction was halted at Basco, as this space would be redundant. Two days later, December 10th, this same naval infantry force was loaded back aboard their ships and sent to take the Babayan Islands just above the North Luzon coastline. The main invasion fleet, Japanese army troops transported by naval forces, had as their primary targets the major cities of Apari and Gozaga on the northeastern corner of Luzon and Vigan on the northwestern corner. Additionally, there were three army landing forces that had departed the Palu Islands about 500 miles east of Mindanao Island in the southern Philippines at the same time. Their goal was to land in southern Luzon and help the fighting there, but also to take Jolo Island, located in between Mindanao and Borneo. But keeping up the pressure on the defenders, the attackers, not content with laying low the Clark and Iba airfields, sent bombing raids against Del Carmen, Nichols, and Nielsen Fields, and 54 Navy bombers against Cavite to destroy its various infrastructure. At Del Carmen Field, 
just below Clark Field, enemy fighters took out 12 P-35s, with six more being damaged. As things stood with this latest air attack, MacArthur had about 30 P-40s left, along with a few obsolete P-35As. Another success, indeed, for the Japanese Navy, they considered this the best news of December 8th, was the destruction of the American submarine Sea Lion, SS-195. Launched in mid-1939, on December 8, 1941, she was docked for an overhaul at Cavite Naval Yard. Taking two direct hits, the sub was beyond repair. As the Navy Yard was wrecked as well, the sub was scuttled with her own depth charges. But, like the battleships at Pearl, where the U.S. Navy repaired them as quickly as possible, a second sea line was commissioned in March of 1944, and in the vein of American revenge for the sudden attack on forces in the Pacific, this second sea line, SS-315, put four torpedoes into the enemy battleship Congo. Those torpedoes were named after the four sub-crewmen that died on December 8th. 1941. Foster, O'Connell, Paul, and Ogilvy. With the air attack of December 8th, Admiral Thomas Hart ordered his surface fleet to head south. There they would join with British and Dutch vessels to hopefully curtail any further Japanese attacks. But as we have seen, there was little success there as well. Hart's subs and PT boats were ordered to remain and hinder, as much as possible, the coming Japanese invasion. Postscript. Unsurprisingly, after December 8th, and certainly after the war, MacArthur, Brereton, and Sutherland would strive mightily to get their version of that day's events out, hoping to make them the official history. Hence, there are still gaps for that morning. The ancients, and particularly the Romans, have taught us that responsibility for success or failure stops at the feet of the general in charge. When the rebel King Jugurtha was finally caught in North Africa, Sulla had done the work, but Gaius Marius was in overall command, hence the credit went to him. This would be the beginning of the end of their friendship, but in Western culture, Marius was right, and it would be President Truman who would have on his desk a sign that read, The buck stops here, as in he was taking responsibility for all that happened on his watch, at least in theory. So where does this leave MacArthur? By the time of Pearl Harbor, MacArthur was already a hero to the American people. And as the sad events continued to play out in the Pacific, MacArthur's messages back home some of them outright lies, portrayed him as the country's only hope. Indeed, MacArthur practically invented public relations for the U.S. Army. But all this generalization can be pushed aside to focus on that day. I personally believe, for what it's worth, that Walter Borneman got it right when he said that, one, MacArthur, being human, was just as shocked as everyone else and overwhelmed, and two, with MacArthur's massive ego, and that cannot be forgotten, this attack went against his plan to be ready in the spring of 42. Hence, he was unable to roll with the punches, so to speak. MacArthur agreed with President Quezon's wishful thinking that perhaps the Philippines would be left out of the building conflict between Washington and Tokyo, Naive is the only word that covers this. As the saying goes, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. The very idea of practice is to be physically and emotionally ready when the day comes, and in case nerves are frayed, the next act, i.e. moving into defensive positions, had already been worked out. Another part of the equation may have been simple prejudice. The Americans and the British had ideas that ran rampant through their respective militaries, that the Japanese were not respectable warriors. After all, they had been fighting the Chinese since 1937 and seemed 
unable to prevail there. Yes, there was also prejudice against the Chinese. Adding on to this, it seems that some of MacArthur's staff believed that as the Japanese were operating near Hawaii, then they clearly could not put together another strong force to threaten a second or even third area. But as history shows, on that day, December 8th, local time, Kota Baru of British Malaya, nearby Singora in Thailand, Singapore, Guam, Hong Kong, Wake, and the Philippines would be successfully attacked, and Shanghai was occupied. For the Japanese, their opening moves had been in the planning stages for years. And lastly, for now, we get to the question of MacArthur's Air Force. The P-40s and the B-17s were respectable enough, though they weren't in enough numbers to seriously deter the Japanese. Again, MacArthur was thinking of having another four months or so. And when December 8th was over, the defenders had lost at least half of their air force. So was Brereton right in that the B-17s should have been sent over early that morning to see if they could stop the enemy from launching their attacks? The B-17s, in this case C's and D's, did not have enough defensive weapons on board and the P-40s did not have the range to escort them to Formosa. To MacArthur's thinking, it would have been suicide to send them. My response, yes and no. By doing next to nothing, he was risking losing some of his Air Force anyways, and perhaps it would have been better to risk them by raiding the enemy early that morning. Yes, the reconnaissance needed to be updated, and yes, clouds were an issue, but there was still a chance of hitting the enemy's airfields, ships, shipyards, facilities, and, in a best-case scenario, their planes while they were on the ground. The Japanese would have been most reluctant to launch any attack without first controlling the skies. But this is all surmise and hindsight, something that should be left to the field of entertainment. The end result was that MacArthur's air defenses went the same way as Pearl Harbor. Despite this, the general would send exaggerated reports back to Washington of all the fighting he was doing. But no amount of bravado would change the situation in the skies over Luzon nor on the ground. The Japanese were coming, and MacArthur, a hero of the first degree in his own mind, could do nothing to stop.